So maybe I used to hire guys to beat up in China, but let me explain. So for years I have been what you might call a wandering ronin. I have been a martial artist without a clan, a black belt without a school, something like this. Uh, I started my journey about 30 years ago in martial arts and um, yeah, you know, it's had its up years, it's down years, but overall I'm a, I'm a pretty sincere and conscientious practitioner of the craft. I've studied a lot of styles in martial arts uh, and used to... Um, you know, teach formally within a few systems almost two decades ago, and since then have built businesses in Shanghai and Hong Kong to do just that, to teach martial arts, self-defense, among other mind-body stuff. What happened along the way, which is kind of interesting, is that some of the skills that I have practiced, predominantly related to locking and controlling techniques you might find in Hapkido, Jiu-Jitsu, Aikido, um, I trained to a fair level, I guess, but traveling over the years, you know, traveling to China and then Thailand and then Hong Kong and, and bouncing around Asia for a bit uh, and also starting to teach full time and not really building a school, but I, a lot of the, the teaching I did was, was private, right, for people that didn't have a lot of time. Um, and that was earlier before I started more of a, a physical location where I could do groups. But in those years, I didn't have anybody to work with myself. Um, and so what you find in most schools is that people get to the higher ranks or they start teaching and they still have a student base where they can still have interactions and, and not only you know, demonstrate with some of those advanced people, but still find people that they can execute and, and practice those techniques with themselves. So I wound up in a lot of cases needing to submit myself to other student learnings but I didn't have anybody to continue my own training with. So I got around it very simply. I put out an advertisement in one of the you know, Chinese online forums. I uh, had somebody translate it for me and I think it read something like, uh, you know, martial artists needed or some, somebody with a high pain tolerance uh, needed, martial arts skill preferred, something along these lines. Uh, and I think for the, you know, the cool sum of maybe $15, it was like 100 100 RMB at the time, I'd get about an hour and a half uh, with a guy who pretty much let me beat the hell out of him. So why might I do this? Look, it's critical in martial arts to get hands-on experience, and there's a few ways to do it, right? One way is to find really engaged partners to work with that are willing to actually go through the shit with you, ex expose their, their bodies and their joints to, to throws and locks and, uh, you know, chokes and these types of things. The other way is to compete, which can have a little bit more fallout. Both are effective, but I find that the, the, technical, the technical requirements for most locking and controlling techniques, those that you might find in Hapkido, Aikido, Jiu Jitsu, they're tough and they take a long time to do well. And now I don't mean you can't make them look good in a studio or in a dojo or working with students, but what I mean is if you want to use these for self-defense, and look at them as beyond demonstrative and flashy techniques, they require a lot of training. So much more training than any of the striking arts by far. And the main reason behind that is because bodies move and with that, joints and alignment of your opponent move and your relationship to that person in space moves, right? When you're striking somebody, they might move a little, you might move a little, but it's a straight shot, a very quick technique, and you either hit them or you don't, right? But with a locking technique, a lot of force vectors are at play. A lot of anatomical alignments and misalignments need to be felt through. And this takes a lot of practice. So, you know, over the years, I did learn a few things by, by doing things this way, but I put in, I don't know how many hours, but I did work through three partners over the years, and I remember them fondly except for Champion, that treacherous knave. But the first one, Champion, um, John Ping was his name. We had some good times. Then there was Dong Dong. That's right, Dong Dong. Uh, and then there was Bo Hao, who stayed with me for a good amount of time and was probably the best fit for me. 
Bo Howe also had the most experience with locking controlling arts. He was a black belt in Aikido. Um, but they were all experienced. They were, they were all black belts in different disciplines. And so when I say I beat these guys up, um, yeah, it's not something I'm proud of, but I think it's something that was, you know, nobody got hurt, I think, but it gave me an opportunity to do things that I don't think would have been quite uh, appropriate or legal in an American martial arts school. But I, I originally hired uh, Zhang Ping, champion, nickname champion, um, for my sash demo, which some of you guys might have seen years back, I did this thing. Uh, and this was a brutal preparation. I probably spent four months at least physically preparing for the demo. And what I didn't know at the time is that you don't actually have to do all the techniques. You can hide a lot of shit with, uh, with camera angles and cool, funky shit. But so yeah, in the course of that, I mean, the techniques that I demonstrate, I mean, I went through these more times than I could count. And so what might look a little bit glossed up for the camera or for the demo, I would challenge you to reconsider. Um, these techniques are vicious. The sash techniques are fucking vicious, painful. Uh, the locks that you can perform with your hands pale in comparison to those that you can do with the sash, the chokes pale in comparison. It's a vicious weapon. It just, it doesn't look that aggressive on camera. But when you feel the cinch and the manipulations from that tool, it'll make you a believer. And then over the years, I you know worked with a few other guys. So Dong Dong couldn't do some of the other stuff. So I mostly worked with him on my striking, and then eventually Bo Hao for the joint manipulations again. But with these guys, over the course of an hour and a half with them, this would be an hour and a half straight of continuous throws and locks and chokes and pressure point grinding and submissions, and it was just constant. Uh, and it was not. I mean incredibly resilient guys and two out of the three wound up asking me to become their teacher after a while and, and have a mutual exchange because they realized there was a lot there for them to take away. But I did take away a few things, a couple things that this is turning into a longer rant than I intended, but let me get to the, the couple things that I, I wanted to share. So the first thing, the first thing, compliance kills knowledge. Now let me explain that a little bit. Anytime that you're learning a technique in a controlled environment, your ideal is perfection, right? You look at, look at the technique, you're trying to mirror that to the best of your ability, apply it to the best of your ability. But this can never be an accurate representation of that technique applied because you'd be breaking a joint uh, or you know, seriously injuring your opponent partner in that process. So there's a gap here, and, and, and it's a problem for anybody trying to work on especially sensitivity-based, you know, locking and controlling techniques because techniques start to fall apart when you add volatility. So understanding that when you're training a technique in a comfortable environment and there's no real pressure, anything can look good. But as soon as you start to add a little bit of heat and volume and fatigue and things aren't quite working right, I didn't speak great Chinese with these guys at the time and none of them could speak English. So I couldn't give them verbal cues. We had to do it all by feel and body communication and they had to learn quick how to move so that they didn't lose a joint. Uh, and I also had to learn how to give better cues and manipulate the body prior to putting on the full lock. So that was great. But it was in this interaction of applied pressure that taught me that you need to, you need to look at so many scenarios and adaptations to be able to fully comprehend it. And so if you comply too closely with a strict technical instruction and form, what you wind up missing is the ability to understand and adapt for yourself. This needs to be acquired over time through a lot of trial and error, a lot of trial and error, hundreds of hours of trial and error, especially if you're talking about uh, controlling and locking techniques. Number two, sensitivity trumps techniques. What do I mean by that? So again, getting back, all of us have a baseline of technique. Let's say you've got 10 or 20 core foundational locking or controlling techniques in your art. Again, in a controlled scenario, you're going to be working toward perfect execution in a controlled environment. Now, the only, the only group that does this particularly well is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because they are constantly working uh, in 
application-based training through sparring so they can go close to the limit of that threshold without serious injury and then they can back off. All the other standing arts, the standing jiu-jitsu arts and hapkido arts, they don't do this very well because there is no way to engage in these techniques methodically under pressure, right? In BJJ, you can roll hard with people on the mats and, you, and you're making sure that there's this constant conversation, but you can't do that with standing joint locks. It doesn't work. And so what you need to be able to acquire over time is to try those techniques. You understand the formal application. You try to do that in controlled environments, but then you got to work with real bodies, different bodies, different force vectors, different body weights, different relationships, whether or not they're grabbing, whether or not they're choking, whether or not they're coming in with a strike. You have to look at it from all these different scenarios so that you understand that it, this isn't as simple as you applying a technique on, let's say a wrist lock, you applying a technique on a hand or a wrist. Okay, great. What happens now when that person is slightly falling forward, moving back, trying to pull their hand away, trying to strike you? All these things have tremendous volatility to the technique. And so what is most important in this equation is that you become sensitive to the, bottom, the body mechanics, the biomechanics of your opponent. Feeling those anatomical shifts and how those joints start to align and move once you've got a hand on your opponent, once you start to feel that resistance and feel that pulling back, can you stick, can you withdraw? You know, if you've got a hand on that opponent, understanding in real time as they start to move and maneuver how you need to change your technique to keep the lock on. A very baseline principle in Tai Chi is called the reverse locking principle. Tai Chi and I believe Wing Chun. A very, a very kind of rudimentary concept about locking, but it's a, it's a, it's a great technique to kind of frame this with which is simply move the joint in the opposite way of how it's intended. Pretty easy, right? So let's take a, an elbow lock, for example. This is very easy, right? It's, it's, a linear, it's a linear lock. There's one primary direction. Now, a good lock will have multiple force vectors, but let's just take that. This goes up, this goes down. That's an elbow lock, right? And we might look at other types of twists and grinds to really amplify the, the intensity of that lock. But let's say that we get this on somebody. Now what happens when they start to pull and maneuver and manipulate? Make these simulations in most martial arts classes and we just don't assume that's going to happen. And if they do, we crank it on to prove how tough we are. But the reality is those shifts matter. So you need to be able to, in real time, adjust your body to the direction of the elbow. It's not, you don't always have perfect control, which means your technique is not always going to be constant. You need to learn to feel those shifts in their alignment so that you can adapt the technique to maintain control of the opponent. Number three, okay, transitions are essential. Uh, I'm going to go on a limb here. This might, this might offend some people. So the locking, the, the primary standing locking arts, we've got Hapkido, Jiu-Jitsu, Taijitsu. I may be missing some, but to my knowledge, these are the three most sophisticated and I'm a big fan of all three of them, but all three lack the same thing, which is transitional movements. I trained with a, a, an MMA fighter in Hong Kong uh, for a bit who revolutionized my, 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 uh, my grappling arm bar, my, my uh, arm bar from the guard. And I had, I had had maybe a three or four, five step kind of arm bar prior to working with him. And he showed me a technique that was like, it felt like I was being smothered by his technique in such a way that he worked up the range of my body and put the lock on in a way that every single step of that action was in complete control. And this revolutionized the way, I mean, it's probably common for jujitsu uh, BJJ guys, but it's not common for other standing grapplers. They don't understand the importance of control along the way and within that transitions. So a couple arts that do transitions extremely well. You've got Wing Chun, uh, you've got Tai Chi push hands, believe it or not, and you've got Filipino boxing. To my knowledge, these are the three best arts that teach transitional stages. And with that, the stuff that goes from striking to grappling, the stuff that actually allows you to understand and intercept the technique without assuming guy's going to punch and he's going to hold his hand out, which is not genuine in any way, right? The reality is people often punch fast and hard. Locking is still a phenomenal way to control an individual. But what that means is you need to understand how to how to deal with those types of strikes, right? Not everything starts from a grapple. Not everything requires a punch to the head if you can't, you know, work from another strike. But locking can be extremely useful against a striker. But what that means is 
you need ways of transitioning into those techniques that control each stage of the process. So that is to say that the last thing uh, that I want to mention, number three, is that people that are working on transitions or even bridging the gap from different ranges of fighting, from striking to trapping to grappling, for example, there is very little consideration for the transitions through these. Check out your Filipino boxing techniques, the Ron Belikis and uh, the Dan and Santos, and some of these guys have phenomenal transitions in um, that are highly sophisticated and they're putting you at better points of both leverage and positioning, in the same way you might play chess, right? They're working through positions to increase the probability of a successful lock through sticking, through intercepting. It's a good way to think about locking technique. As usual, a longer rant than planned. Uh, if you're still here, thanks for, thanks for bearing with me. Any questions on this stuff, guys, please leave them in the comments. Any comments, please leave them in the comments. Um, and if you got something that you uh, are curious about or you want me to look at, please uh, just let me know. Um, got received quite a few good uh, recommendations of late, and I'll be working through those shortly. But uh, yeah, until the next time, please like, subscribe, be weightless. Yeah.